Thanks, Phil, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to see you all. And I'm going to attempt now to share my screen, which never quite goes as everybody intends, does it? So just going to check that's working. That appears to be working from my perspective. I've got a thumbs up from Dave, which is always a good thumb to see up in this respect. So God rules in the kingdom of men. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And I'm sure you would look at me and say, what would cause you to make such a bold claim? Well, what we want to do is take some first steps into understanding, if we haven't already, what the Bible teaches about this subject. And by doing so, we hope to interest you in the overall message of this amazing book. But before we examine any part of the Bible, First, we need to acknowledge the facts that we observe around us in regard to, to how, how the world is ruled and, and governed. It's very easy to observe that the kingdoms and nations of the world are ruled over by men and women, many of whom, when we, we think about them, do not even claim to believe in, God, in a God. And even if they do believe in a God, their rulership, sometimes leads to actions that seem to uh, be at variance with the teachings of most world religions when you begin to examine them. So why make such a bold and seemingly contradictory claim in the face of, of evidence that we might see on a sort of daily, weekly, monthly basis? The claim that in fact God rules in the kingdom of men. Well, Let's be clear from the start, this is not my claim. These are words recorded in the Bible, the book that declares itself to be the inspired word of God. So it is a divine, a unique message to mankind. And I've just put up there some passages you may want to look at later. Of course, we've just read uh, a slightly longer version of that third one. Um, these are passages that support that claim. And you may have noticed that as we were reading from Second Peter chapter one, this claim that this is the word of God. People were moved to record it, that these are, are prophecies in some cases, foretellings of things before they happen. And they challenge us to accept the authority behind this book, that it is from God. <coughs> now, if we are prepared to accept that the Bible is from God, that it is, in fact, the only source of God's true teaching to us, then it has many fascinating claims that can greatly impact our lives. And, and one key claim is declared in the very opening page of the Bible, the claim that God is the creator. Now, we find this recorded in the first book of the Bible in its opening declaration, and thus we read, in Genesis 1 verse 1, the very first words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And later, about halfway through our Bibles, we find another statement about God. Not that this is the only one, of course, just an, a sample. But this one's made by a, a faithful man called Jeremiah in the book named after him. And he records this about God, that, that God hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion and in the final book of the bible the same as i say consistent message is delivered so we read in revelation chapter 4 thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created so this can lead us to a, a first step in understanding and, and perhaps a first conclusion we might make. The Bible repeatedly teaches that God is the creator. It encourages us to come to understand and accept that God created this planet as well as all life upon it. And that, of course, includes mankind. And if this is the case, then we must also acknowledge that God has the right to do with his creation as he sees fit. And that in a way leads us on to our next key claim, that God 
has ultimate dominion. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that's, this may seem quite an old fashioned word, perhaps, to use, but it does summarize the ideas of possession, control, rulership that the Bible states in dif differing ways. Uh, and again, some examples just to give you a sense of this. First of all, from the New Testament part of the Bible, the Apostle Paul makes this claim in when he's talking to people about the message of the Bible, the message from God. He says in Acts 17, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And then if we go back into our Old Testament, the other half of, of the Bible, in the poetical writings, um, the section there that, that is, is poetry and different forms of, of, of song, we read the famous King David's words. He, he writes this in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And we can see there two halves that he's talking about the world itself, the planet. And then he's talking about everything upon the planet, the, the things that inhabit, that, that dwell therein. And David repeats this idea in another section of the Old Testament, this time in the history section, as part of a coronation prayer that's recorded there for his son, Solomon. So we read in 1 Chronicles 29, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as heaven above all. So even though Solomon was being crowned, David was reminding his son that really God is the ultimate ruler. He is the one who the kingdom belonged to, which is an interesting thing for us to think about. So perhaps we can draw a second conclusion that as the creator of the earth and all its inhabitants, well, then all those things belong to God. He is described as both the Lord and the king over it. So there's more than just the idea of possession. There is the idea of rulership. And he's the head overall, which uh, sim uh, stimulates the ideas of authority. So it should not surprise us to think of God then ruling over his creation and, and seeing that um, language being used in, in our Bible. But why did God create the earth and life upon it? What was the point? Well, here, here is a next claim for us to think about that God did so because he has a purpose. And again, we find this indicated at different uh, in different places through our Bible, sometimes very obviously, sometimes by implication. Here's the words um, that form a future prophecy in a, um, a book uh, written by a man called Habakkuk, uh, who was inspired by God. So he said, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there is a, a purpose that the earth is filled with knowledge, the knowledge of the glory of God. Again, at the end of our Bible, we, we've already read these words, but think about them in this respect now uh, in terms of the purpose. In Revelation 4, we read, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and here's the purpose, for thy pleasure they are and were created. And the Lord Jesus taught this idea in what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It may be something people don't think about when they perhaps repeat it or have learned it at school, if that, that's the only time they've come into uh, contact with it. But in Matthew 6, verse 9, these are the words. After this manner, therefore, pray, Jesus said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So again, we can draw some conclusions from passages such as this. God created the earth with a purpose in mind. This purpose is revealed through different statements. For example, that the earth should be filled with the knowledge of God's glory, with people knowing what God's glory is all about. We're told that all things were created to give God pleasure as well. And also that there is a need for God's will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. <clears throat> 
we might notice then that the future tense is often used when describing God's purpose. And this is because God's purpose with his creation is yet to be fully fulfilled. If you think about it, the earth now is not filled with the knowledge of God's glory. In fact, many people no longer believe in God, let alone understand and know his glory. And nor can we imagine that God finds pleasure in all his creation at present. Much of this beautiful planet is ravaged by, by exploitation, by pollution, by overpopulation, by violence, etc., etc., most of which is caused by mankind. And when you think about it, this is because God's will is not done on the earth by the majority of humanity. Even those who do try to do um, to obey God's teachings and therefore do his will, they will openly acknowledge that they fail spectacularly the majority of the time and so fall short of what God really wants. So why, we might ask, if God created the earth, if he rules over it, and if he has a purpose for it, why does this planet seem to be in such a mess? Surely the state of the world, some would argue, is evidence against God's control. And that leads us to our next claim, that man was made in God's image and given dominion. Now let's explore this idea for, for a moment. It's a clear idea from the very first chapter of the Bible. If we go back to Genesis 1, a little later than when we read in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But in verse 26, there we read another summary of God's purpose. We read, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Later in history, coming back to King David, who we've already thought about a little, he would reflect that same purpose through these poetic words in Psalm 8 this time, verses 4 to 6. David says, what is man that thou, God, art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So again, there's a conclusion that we might draw from passages such as this, that the Bible teaches us that mankind is actually unique in all God's creation. We were created to be in God's image and likeness, something not um, explained about anything else that God made. So there is an intention there in these verses that, that teaches us that, that God wanted us to be like him, like him in character, in desire, in purpose. And we might note that God chose to give mankind, therefore, dominion over his creation, too. But we should ask ourselves, what did God want us to do with that dominion? Were we supposed to lord it over creation, abusing the power given us to exploit and cause harm? Or were we, in fact, intended to love this wonderful creation, to see it as a gift from God? and therefore to cherish and care for it. So the, the question is, does dominion mean despotic rulership, or does it mean responsible stewardship? Well, having been made to be in God's image and likeness, God did not make humans as automatons. He gave us the ability to make our own decisions, just as God makes decisions. We might refer to this in shorthand as, as free will. And the problem is, therefore, that humans have always failed to consistently match the free will given to them by God, to God's will, to therefore be like him in terms of intention 
and following that intention through. And that leads us to our next claim, that man uses his free will to go against God. Now, again, we see this indicated in different parts of our Bible, if we don't even just acknowledge it for ourselves. So in the Old Testament, again, we have this divine appeal recorded by a prophet called Isaiah. So in Isaiah 55, God speaking through the prophet says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So we can see there the language of people who are doing the wrong thing but being called to come back to God's ways, to trying to, to please God, and that God would forgive that and, and, and acknowledge it and respond to it. And in the New Testament, again, dipping into the uh, writings of the Apostle Paul, he quotes from the Old Testament part of the Bible. He wants to prove the same point to fellow believers when he's writing to them. These are believers in Rome. So in the letter to the Romans, in chapter 3, we read, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a sad picture, isn't it? But it leads us to another conclusion. The Bible consistently teaches that humans have failed to live up to God's original intention. We consistently make ungodly choices and need to be called back to God's ways and thoughts, not always responding even when we are called. When we're not choosing to be in God's image and likeness, we are described by words such as wicked or unrighteous or unprofitable and it's said that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious intentions for us to be like him well that's a huge problem then isn't it God gave us dominion over his creation but our rulership is ultimately flawed going by these passages and this is because as we say we use our free will to go against God and his purpose much of the time, whether we mean to or, or not. This falling short of God's intended purpose is summarised by the Bible language, sin, all have sinned. But now we come to that great claim that we started with, that God rules in the kingdom of men. Now this is vital for it declares to us that God has not forsaken his creation to us, and for us to be out of control with this planet, nor has he given up on mankind. And he certainly still intends to fulfill his purpose upon the earth. So the Bible also teaches us this as well, that God is working to direct events to still bring his purpose to fulfillment. And the Bible shows that God chose to reveal this in particular detail to a specific world leader, a man called King Nebuchadnezzar. And he ruled over the superpower of his day, the empire of Babylon. Now God gave Nebuchadnezzar special visions of the future. And these visions were interpreted for him by one of God's prophets, the man Daniel. And it's in the book of Daniel that our title phrase is used, God rules in the kingdom of men. And perhaps it's this book, Daniel, more than any other in the Bible, that shows how God is at work in the nations. So just a few examples. So, for example, in Daniel 2, verse 20 and 21, we read, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he, that's God, 
changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understand it. So here Daniel leads us to another conclusion. He clearly states that God works behind the scenes, changing significant times and events, working through them and with them. And these in turn lead to changes in rulership amongst men's nations. Now, this is proved to Nebuchadnezzar, one of these kings, through a God-given dream of a mighty statue. It may have looked something like this. Now, this dream was of the image of a man standing, but this image was made up of different metals for different parts of the body. As the dream progressed, the statue was eventually toppled and destroyed by a stone which replaced it and which then the stone grew into a mountain filling the whole earth. Chapter two of Daniel also records the, um, the God-given interpretation of this imagery. It reveals to Nebuchadnezzar that in time his own kingdom would be taken over by another and that there would in fact be a succession of empires. But it's important to note that these empires were represented by a single statue, as we can see there. In other words, all these empires represented by the different metals actually still represented a single idea, the kingdom of men. Describing these empires using the singular kingdom and not kingdoms, then it reveals God's perspective. From the creator's point of view, he has given dominion to mankind. But unless we do God's will, whoever is ruling, it's always seen as the kingdom of men. However, this amazing prophecy reveals that eventually, after a series of human empires, each of the metals there, change would come. And the kingdom of men would eventually be toppled by a stone that would grow into a mountain that would fill the earth. Now, later in the chapter, Daniel explains the meaning behind this God-given dream. And, and we can read that in Daniel 2, verse 37 and 38. So Daniel says, thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar needed to understand that his dominion had been gifted to him by the one true God, and that therefore he, Nebuchadnezzar, had a responsibility in how he used that power. But more than this, he needed to understand that his kingdom, and in fact every other kingdom created by men, would eventually come to an end. And it's very evident from the powerful imagery seen in the dream. And Daniel explains this in verse 44 to 45, that this imagery represents a change in the world order, a very dramatic one, as we can see. He says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. So Nebuchadnezzar had received in this dream, in this vision, a prophecy of the future. God could reveal this to him because God rules in the kingdom of men. And it is God who is ultimately directing history so that his purpose can be fulfilled at last. God knows the end from the beginning. And this purpose will be fulfilled when God's kingdom can finally replace the flawed rulership that sinful men and women exercise over his creation. 
Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar soon forgot these powerful lessons shared with him by God through Daniel. But God continued to reveal things to him in an attempt to help him understand the truth. So a couple of chapters on in Daniel chapter four, we read that Nebuchadnezzar received a second vision, this time of a mighty tree that was cut down and left as a stump. Now, at the end of the vision, Nebuchadnezzar was told the purpose behind this vision. So Daniel said this to him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. So when Daniel interprets this vision, he reveals a warning that if this mighty king forgot that it was God who was ultimately in control, he would be cut down like the tree. He, Nebuchadnezzar, would be left like a stump until he remembered who it was who had truly given him that power in the first place and that that power should be used to reflect the rulership of God, the creator. Rulership, therefore, that is righteous and merciful, like God. Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way, as we so often do. His pride got the better of him, and he took all the glory for his empire, and that's described in verse 30 of this chapter. He forgot to give God the glory. And it's at this point that we read he was reduced to a beast-like state and lost his rulership. But the narrative continues and a time came when Nebuchadnezzar again recognised the ultimate truth. And we read that in verse 34 and 37. So we read there and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honoured him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. So Nebuchadnezzar was given a powerful personal reminder that God, the Most High, ruled in the kingdom of Babylon, despite Nebuchadnezzar falling into the trap of thinking he was the ultimate ruler. And the same, sadly, is true for all the world's leaders. They may be under the illusion that they hold the power in their countries, but God makes clear in the Bible, especially in this book of Daniel, that he, God, is the one who can raise up leaders and bring them down again, depending on how his purpose is being moved forward and how he is working in the lives of, of people. Now, if the all-powerful God was as intimately at work in Nebuchadnezzar's life, then we can be sure that he is able to work in our lives just as intimately. And this should humble us, as it eventually humbled this mighty king of the empire of Babylon. Now, further examples are evident throughout the Bible. Just to reinforce the point, I want to quickly consider a, a few further passages just to show. Uh, we won't go into anywhere near as much detail. So a sort of contemporary passage is in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 8 to 9. And here we read these words. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. 
So here, in terms of a timeline, we're just a little bit earlier than, than the book of Daniel that we've just been looking at. And here we see one of God's messengers, the prophet Jeremiah, speaking to God's nation of Judah and telling them that Nebuchadnezzar, here, here called Nebuchadnezzar, but it's the same king, he was being sent to invade their land. He was being sent because they had failed to hear God, to hear God's repeated call that they should be in his image and likeness. Now, notice that God here in this passage calls the king of Babylon my servant. And this was because God was really, as we've already seen, the ruler in the kingdom of men. In that way, Nebuchadnezzar was doing what God wanted, whether he understood that or not. God was controlling events to use Babylon's empire building as a way to discipline God's own special nation of Judah. Another prophecy, this time through a prophet called Isaiah, tells of another time when God would use another mighty ruler. This time it's Cyrus the Persian. And so we read in Isaiah 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him and loose the loins of kings. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Now, we might not fully understand what's being said there, but just notice that even though God is talking about Cyrus here and saying Cyrus didn't know the one true God of Israel, he was still anointed and named by that God so that God would continue working out his purpose with the nation of Israel. God was using another ruler here, raising him up to do God's will. In this case, Cyrus would actually end the captivity of the Jews, the captivity that Nebuchadnezzar had imposed that Jeremiah had spoken about. Uh, and so here Cyrus is in, in effect reversing what Nebuchadnezzar did. And again, this was in line with God's will. So Cyrus would allow God's people to return to their homeland. And this was something God had promised, just as he had promised that they would be taken out of it in the first place. So just one other final example, and this one is in the New Testament, just for now, part, this part of our Bible, where we read a letter written to Christian believers by the Apostle Paul. We've already dipped into it, the, the, the letter to the Romans. Now, despite them living under the rule of the pagan Roman Empire, Paul explains that they should accept this rulership. He talks about it in Romans 13 in, in these words. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or condemnation. So, Notice what's being said here. Part of his explanation about Christian behaviour rests on the clear assertion that God was still ruling in the kingdom of men and was appointing those who ruled over them. If this was true in the first century AD in the Roman Empire, and if it was true hundreds of years earlier in, in the Babylonian and the Persian empires of Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, then clearly the Bible is teaching us that it must be true now. God is still ruling over his creation and therefore ruling over the, the various kingdoms and countries of the world, but seeing them all as the kingdom of men. But what does all this mean for us, we might be thinking? Well, we've taken some first steps in seeking to explore the Bible's overall message. And so what might we have learned from it? Well, a final conclusion I, I want really to share at this point is, is this, and it begins negatively. We, we know the world 
is in a fairly awful state. When we look at those who rule over the nations of the world now, we may begin to feel there is little hope or, or no hope in terms of the future. But we can find comfort from what the Bible reveals to us. It, it shows us, it teaches us time and again that God is in ultimate control. We may not always understand how and why, but God is directing events and, and leaders in this world. And the reason for all this is that his purpose might eventually finally be fulfilled. God will set up his kingdom. He will set up his king over the earth. And the Bible reveals that this actually this king over all will be the lowliest of all men, Jesus. It will be a worldwide kingdom, just as the stone of Nebuchadnezzar's dream grew to be a mountain that filled the whole earth. And the kingdom of Jesus will be everlasting. That's what Daniel 2 taught us and other parts of the Bible teach. It will be ruled over by the one man, Jesus, who used his free will to choose to always do what God wants, to always do God's will. Finally, a man who was in God's image and likeness will have dominion over all the earth and he will use that dominion in the way God intended from the beginning of his creation. And if we want to be a part of this, Jesus encouraged us to pray, to use these words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. And perhaps now we're beginning to understand more of what that might mean. And Jesus also taught his followers to seek first the kingdom of God, to make that a priority in their lives, to, to seek God's righteousness as part of that. And then he said, all these things shall be added unto you. And so part of what we should understand from that is then reflected in another declaration, an invitation to all who faithfully trust that God rules in the kingdom of men. Jesus said, then shall the king say unto them, on, on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So eventually God through his son will fully rule and it won't be the kingdom of men, it will be God's kingdom upon this earth. It will be a very different place as we might begin to imagine when God's will is finally done properly. And the question is, are we prepared to look at that invitation there in Matthew 25, accept it, and then act on, on the implications in the Bible about that invitation and what it can mean for us? Thank you.